Um, we have we have Luconde from uh, uh, we used to work together uh, with Luconde in the same company, and uh, then he decided to leave Paradise and jump in hell. No, it's just AWS. <laughs> um, Luconde, please give it yeah. up for him. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. All right. Hello, everyone. How are you doing? Looks, looks, looks like people are cold. I'm not the only one feeling it. I'm kind of hoping being up here will warm me up a little, unless I'm just delusional. So thanks for coming to the talk. As you can see, I'm going to be speaking about spreading applications, controlling traffic, and optimizing costs in Kubernetes. As William already pointed out, my name is Lukonde Mwila, or you can also call me Luke, and I'm a developer advocate for Kubernetes at AWS. So if any of you want to get in touch with me, you can feel free to do so. You can reach out on LinkedIn. I use my full name, so you can search for me. Hopefully, you'll be able to recognize me. Also, I produce a lot of Kubernetes and cloud-native-related content, and you can search for that on YouTube. Subscribe to the channel if you find it interesting. But also, the developer advocacy team that I'm a part of has a dedicated YouTube channel called Containers from the Couch. Similarly, lots of great content that would be useful for you and your teams. Great, we're going to jump right in. So this talk was inspired by a combination of things from the past and the present. The first one being an event several years ago on a specific Black Friday. And at the time, I was working as a developer for a software company, not the same one as William. <laughs> and um, all the developers worked together in a shared open space. So from my vantage point, I could see the screens of some of my work colleagues. Now, because it was Black Friday, as you'd expect, a number of my work colleagues were especially excited to take advantage of the discounts on a particular e-commerce website. And that site was really popular amongst most of the folks at the company. Unfortunately, on that day, some of you might know where this is going, the site crashed. And I could see this from where I was seated. My work colleagues that were trying to access the site were all met with the same screen. And the company had essentially issued out an apology, letting people know that their systems had crashed due to a high volume in traffic. They didn't have that bit there about trying to restore balance in the force. I'm a Star Wars fan, so I threw that in there. So just for the sake of historic accuracy, <laughs> that wasn't there. Now, when you experience something like this as a developer and you're the end user, or even if you're just involved in software architecture and you understand it to some degree, you can't help but ask yourself the question, what would I do if I was in that position? Or how would I have prevented that kind of situation? You, you can kind of empathize with the people involved in that situation because you're also involved in software. So naturally, it spawned a lot of discussions between myself and some of my work colleagues at the time, but even over the years because it was a relatively significant incident. And the general consensus from a lot of those discussions was that if you want to prevent something like this, then you should probably have some form of high availability and auto-scaling mechanisms involved in your architecture. Now, I just want to be clear. We didn't have context as to what the root causes were. So we were basically guessing. But that was a safe guess in terms of the kind of measures that you want to have in place to mitigate the risks of such an outage, especially for a business of its stature and on such an important day. Now, I want to start off by focusing on high availability before I get to auto-scaling. And these two components today are widely considered best practices. They're relatively standard or common patterns. And in many ways, you think of them as straightforward. But you need to give ample thoughts to both high availability and auto-scaling because they come with implications. And the implications that I want to focus on are the cost implications. And so it's all fair and fine to have a highly available architecture. And these architectures are generally fronted by a load balancer that proxies traffic to different upstream servers or destinations. However, you need to give thought to the load balancing algorithm or approach that you're taking in these kinds of setups. For example, if you're going with a round robin or a random approach, you need to be aware of the fact that that means that you're going to have a lot of egress cross zone traffic. And this is one of the points where you incur a lot of costs. And this is something that has been coming up a whole lot with some of the teams that I've been engaging with especially in, in cloud contexts. 
And so high availability is important because it addresses a resilience issue. You want to eliminate having a single point of failure. In addition to that, it improves performance by essentially taking care of the fact that you, have, you don't want to have a minimal number of resources that get strained. But bearing that in mind, you need to be aware of what your particular constraints are for a particular project in order to implement the solution in the best possible way. So there are a lot of costs associated with the load balancing strategy. In addition to that, we also have to consider auto scaling. So this traffic that is being proxied from the load balancer is headed up to upstream destinations. And one of the other common pitfalls is wasted compute capacity. Even while I've been here, I was speaking to a couple of people who shared that they've also been seeing this a whole lot. Do your nodes actually align with the workload requirements? And so auto scaling is important, but another thing that we see that happens a whole lot is over provisioning of compute capacity. And so it's great that now your, your infrastructure is essentially scaled out to accommodate those um, events where you need to scale. However, there are situations where you've provided a whole lot more than what you actually need. The reason for that is probably using a cluster auto scaler that has a more static approach, working with a scaling group in the particular cloud provider that you may be working with. So these two areas incur you a whole lot of costs, and now it's a whole lot more um, critical because we're in a difficult economic time. And a lot of teams do want to take advantage of high availability of their workloads and their infrastructure with Kubernetes, and they want to achieve that in a cloud environment because of what it has to offer, including the elasticity they can, they can get, but they're also trying to find the best ways to address the operational costs associated with such a model. And that's what I'm going to be focusing on. So the first thing that I want to look at is spreading of your application. And there are two different features that you can make use of in Kubernetes in order to spread your application. The first one that I want to focus on is pod affinity rules. And so pod affinity rules are how you can essentially apply scheduling constraints through the form of certain rules that define a relationship between different workloads. It could be, it could be the same workload as well. And that's what you'd essentially want in the case of achieving high availability. And so these specific rules influence the scheduler's behavior when it's placing pods on nodes. So if there is a specific affinity rule between pod A and pod B, or rather, let me say workload A and workload B, and the scheduler has already placed workload A on a specific node, depending on the affinity rule that you have defined, when the scheduler is about to place a pod on a specific node, it's going to look at that relationship and see whether or not they should actually, it should actually be placed on the same host or that or whether it should be on a different AZ. And these rules are based on topology domains. And the topology domain can either be a host or an, or an availability zone. Now, what we're interested in, as you can see in this diagram over here, is an anti-affinity rule. So an affinity rule would essentially be if we want our pods in close proximity, whether that's based on a host topology or if we want, it to be, if we want them to be in the same AZ. With anti-affinity, that's essentially wanting to have somewhat of a repelling effect. We want the pods to repel each other so that they're spread across the different topology domains. And so that's how we would achieve high availability with our application. Next, I want us to consider pod topology spread constraints. So this is the other approach. Now, pod affinity rules, or rather pod anti-affinity rules, can help you achieve high availability, but the issue with them is that it doesn't necessarily address, or rather it introduces a problem of fault tolerance. Pod topology spread constraints not only provide you with high availability, but also deal with the issue of fault tolerance. It gives you more control over how you actually want your pods to be distributed across the different topology domains in your cluster. So if you take a look at this diagram over here, you'll see that we have 10 pod replicas, and they're close to even when it comes to doing this in three different availability zones. We've got a spread of three, four, three. So this is something that you can't really achieve with pod anti-affinity rules, and the reason for that is because they have an anti-affinity toward each other, so you could easily end up with a situation where you have a single replica running on a node, which is not good for fault tolerance and it's not good for resource utilization either. So this works out a whole lot better if you're trying to not only address availability, but also um, fault tolerance of your workloads. And because this is the one I'm going to be uh, showing you or demonstrating a little bit later, I'm going to focus on the kind of properties that you would be defining. So these are the properties that you would primarily be concerned with if you're going to use pod topology spread constraints. I'm going to start off by focusing on max skew. And max skew 
is how you would define the maximum point to which you want imbalance or inequality for the distribution of your pods across the different topology domains. So if we take the example from the previous diagram, just gonna go back quickly so you can see that. So that's 10 replicas for three different availability zones. There's no way to equally spread the number of pods, but what we can do is say we want a maximum imbalance or inequality of one, which is why we've got 343. Three. So that could easily end up also being 433. Three. Now, the max Q can be anything between the value of one and the number of replicas that you have. So in that case, it would be between one and 10. So if you went with 10, then that means there'd be a chance of which you end up with 10 replicas in a single topology domain, whether that's a host or an availability zone. And you'll see over there, there's also the topology key. And this is the key that's going to be attached to the nodes. It's gonna be one of the labels, and it's how you essentially define the, the kind of topology that you wanna work with, whether you want it to be a zonal approach or if you want it to be a host. And when unsatisfiable is somewhat self-explanatory, this is how you want the scheduler to respond in the case that it can't meet these scheduling constraints. So if you want it to still go ahead and schedule the pods anyway, or if you want, it, if you want those pods to remain in a pending state. And then lastly, we have the label selector, and this is similar to pod affinity rules, and in this case, it's essentially saying which pods, or, or rather, any pods that have this particular label or these labels are the ones that have the relationship for which these constraints should be applied. So that's pod affinity rules and pod topology spread constraints. That would be how you would achieve availability of your application. But the next thing that we want to consider now is to start addressing those two main areas of optimizing our costs, the load balancing area, and then we'll get to the nodes a little later. But let's start off with controlling traffic. And I'm going to demonstrate, or rather speak about two different approaches that you can take. The first approach I'm going to discuss will be through the use of Istio. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with Istio, it's an implementation of a service mesh, and the job of a service mesh in a nutshell is essentially to unburden applications from having to deal with networking concerns. And they generally do that in these four main domains, connecting of the applications, securing those connections, controlling traffic or traffic management, in addition with that also adding resilience mechanisms and um, as well as having observability features. Now what we're concerned about in this particular case is controlling traffic. So changing the way load balancing is actually going to work. So if we look at the diagram over here, you'll notice that we have a request that starts from a particular end user and their request goes through to the load balancer that is exposed by the Istio ingress gateway. That, tra that traffic then gets proxied to that component there that says virtual service. The job of a virtual service in Istio works a lot like ingress. So if you're familiar with the ingress resource, this is essentially how routing takes place. You define your routing rules using virtual services. After routing takes place, you can apply additional policies such as what we're actually about to carry out, which is controlling the traffic, and you would do that with destination rules. And with the destination rules, what we can actually do is essentially say for traffic coming from a certain point of origin, we want it to go to a certain destination. And so some of you might already be familiar with these concepts when you think of different deployment strategies, directing a certain amount of traffic to a certain version of an application for either a blue-green deployment or a canary deployment. But in this case, what we actually want to be doing is taking advantage of Istio's feature known as locality weighted load balancing. And if I'm correct, other service meshes also have this. So Istio essentially takes the information of the topology domains in your cluster and uses that information in order for you to actually carry this out. So for a load balancer, which is highly available, and I'll, I'll demonstra demonstrate that a little bit later, so let's say it, we have our cluster running in the region EU West 1, and we've also got a load balancer that's highly available, so it's across three different availability zones, EU West 1, A, B, and C. Traffic that hits that particular load balancer, we want to configure it in such a way that we say for traffic coming from EU West 1, A, it should go to an application that is running in EU West 1, A and we can determine how much of that traffic goes where. So in this case, you'll see with this particular diagram, I'm saying 60% of traffic to EU West 1A, 40% to EU West 1B. And this is a powerful mechanism because this is one of the ways that you can drastically reduce the egress traffic costs. So I think some of you are probably being kind and just nodding your head as I was talking about Istio, because I know there's sometimes not so much love for Istio because of the operational complexity associated with it, and it's totally understandable. 
Uh, but something that has been interesting while these kinds of issues have been coming up and I've had the chance to engage with different teams, they've essentially been faced with two main options. It's either they go the approach of using the destination rules that Istio has to offer, or they accelerate upgrading their cluster to a point that they can make use of topology-aware hints. And um, if I'm correct, topology-aware hints became hit a beta level as of 1.23, and I think it's still in a beta state. But you might have situations where some teams are running older versions of Kubernetes, and so they can't make use of topology-aware hints. But I still want to speak about it so that some of you may be aware of that in case you're running a version that allows you to make use of this feature. And just for a bit more context, I'm going to go through how the process of routing traffic happens when, uh, when we're load balancing for our particular applications. So we've got services. Again, most of you, if not all, are already familiar with this. And our services are a stable network abstraction layer that sit in front of our pods because our pods are ephemeral. So they have a static IP. Now, because our pods are, have a short life cycle, those IPs are continuously changing. But when, I, when those pods are actually alive, their IPs are stored in what are known as endpoints. And every time that a service is created, there are endpoint slices that get created. And those endpoint slices are created by the endpoint slice controller. And the endpoint slice controller is what's actually responsible for allocating the different endpoints for the IPs to the different topology domains in your cluster. And so if you have a highly available cluster across EU, West 1, A, B, and C, the endpoint slice controller is going to be responsible for allocating the different endpoints into these different topology domains. Now, when you, when you do that, the next thing is the queue proxy is a daemon set that's running on each of the different nodes. And the queue proxy is also serving a form of internal routing. And what it does is it consumes from the endpoint slices. Now, outside of topology aware hints, each of these endpoints just has information about the specific pod, its IP address, the node that it's running on, and any additional topology information. But when you have topology aware hints enabled, this is what happens. So you can see without hints, the endpoint slices have endpoints that essentially say we serve traffic for just about any zone. But when hints are enabled, it essentially has, there's an endpoint with a specific availability zone based on the one where that pod is actually running. So if we have a pod running in EU West 1A, that information is stored in a particular endpoint, and then the endpoint slice controller is going to add a hint saying that you should serve traffic coming from EU West 1A. So that's the mechanism to essentially control traffic to be within a specific zone to minimize the costs associated with egress cross zone traffic. So those are the two approaches. Hopefully that helps you with when you're trying to consider which approach to take. Again, having a service mesh does come with operational complexity, additional domain knowledge, and it might be a case where your team is not in a position to take on that. Alternatively, um, if you decide to go with topology aware hints, you just need to be aware of the specific version of Kubernetes that you would have to be running in order to take advantage of that approach. But the process of actually going, getting running with topology aware hints is really simple. It's just in ensuring that your nodes have the relevant topology domains. And if you're running a Kubernetes cluster in a cloud environment, that automatically gets generated for you. Those topology domains are attached as labels to the respective nodes. And then you would simply need to add an annotation to the service that you want to have um, actually managing the, the service that's going to be proxying traffic to the different pods in order for hints to work out. All right, so then lastly, before I get to the demo, I want to turn to managing nodes. So just by show of hands, has anyone here heard of Carpenter? OK, great, a couple of people. Um, and who here is familiar with the Kubernetes cluster autoscaler? OK, most people, which is great. And it's, an, it's a fantastic project. And several years ago, before I was in developer ad advocacy and was still consulting, that's the project that we primarily used. But a challenge that we run into then was the fact that the cluster autoscaler takes a static approach to scaling. It works specifically with an autoscaling group in a particular cloud environment, whether you're using AWS or Google or a different cloud provider. And so this can be particular ch particularly challenging when you're trying to deal with the whole issue of reducing costs and improving resource utilization for the underlying nodes. And what Carpenter does differently is the fact that it's more dynamic and instead of working with a scaling group, instead it looks at pods that are in a pending state and takes into, considera into consideration their specific pod requirements as well as their scheduling constraints 
and then reaches out directly to the EC2 API in order for it to provision the nodes that are actually needed for those particular workloads. And so this um, drastically improves your resource, resource utilization as well. In addition to that, um, Carpenter also has a feature called cons workload consolidation. When workload consolidation is enabled, Carpenter is continuously monitoring the nodes in your cluster that it controls to see whether or not resource utilization is at a good level. And in the case that a number, in, in, in the case that any node is underutilized, then it will essentially remove that node from your cluster and consolidate things to make sure that there is improved resource utilization on the nodes that are actually needed in order for you to save on costs as well. Now, obviously, the big challenge with Carpenter is even though it's an open source project, at this particular point in time, it only has, there's only support for the AWS cloud provider, so there's still an open issue. So this is also somewhat of an invitation for more people to get involved with the project in order for it to be extended to additional cloud providers as well. Now, one of the other things that I love about Carpenter is the fact that it also respects scheduling constraints. So to circle back to where I started from in terms of high availability, when you put particular topology spread constraints in place for your workloads, Carpenter will be able to respect those things when it's adding nodes to your cluster. All right, so that's the talk. What I'm gonna do now is switch to a demo to show you a specific focus on controlling traffic. Zoom in a little here. Okay, can everyone see that clearly? Great. So, the application that I want to focus on is a basic Node.js application. And so it's actually two different versions of the same application. And the reason I'm doing that is because they're going to give me different responses for the exact same endpoint. And I just want to be able to differentiate between the, the two different applications when traffic is being proxied to see whether or not our destination rule configurations are actually working as expected. So I'm just gonna scroll down slightly here so you can see that. You'll notice that we have one application that is using version 1.1.2, and this one is called Express Test. If I scroll down further, this is Express Test 2, and Express Test 2 is running 1.1. Dot four. Now, both of them have topology spread constraints applied. Now, if you take a look at this, you'll see that this is the exact same code block that I walked through earlier when I was talking about topology spread constraints. In addition to that, I've got a node selector to ensure that these pods are only placed on nodes that are added by Carpenter. So that's our application, and they're going to be fronted by a cluster IP service that proxies to those two different applications, treating them as if they're the same one, or rather two different versions of the same application. And then next over here is a custom resource definition file known as a provisioner. So this is the file that would essentially control the life cycle of your nodes in Carpenter. And you can have multiple provisioners, or you can have a single one. So in this case, I've got a provisioner dedicated to my express test workload. As you can see here, it's called express test. And you can apply different parameters or constraints for how you want Carpenter to, to add nodes to your cluster. So in this case, it's already defined to add nodes to every one of the availability zones. In the case that you wanted to add constraints to that, you can do that. If you wanna restrict it to only adding spot instances, that's something that you can also apply. In my case, I want both spot instances and on-demand instances. And you can also add further configurations like defining the instance families you want, which is a really powerful feature because Obviously, there are certain instance families that are more costly than others, and so you can be able to manage that. And then right at the top here is consolidation, and you can see it's enabled. So remember, this is that feature that I spoke about that allows Carpenter con to continuously watch your nodes to ensure that it's checking whether, whether resource utilization is at an optimum level so that it also just keeps working to reduce your cluster costs and removing nodes that aren't needed. All right, next up over here is our destination rule. This is that custom resource definition file um, for Istio. And as you can see over here, I'm just gonna focus on the distribution section. And you can see what I'm saying is for traffic coming from EU West 1A, I want 80% of it to go to EU West 1A and 10% to B and 10% to C. 
and the other sections are very similar. 80% of traffic coming from EU West 1B should go to EU West 1B. So this is basically minimizing the amount of cross-zone traffic. And then real quick, just to show you, I'm gonna, this is the script that I'm going to be running. They're all sharing the same Istio ingress gateway. And you can see that's the endpoint I'm going to be accessing, because remember I have those two different versions of the same application. So the requests are going to be sent there, and it will go through that same flow from the diagram that I had up, virtual service, destination roles, and eventually through to our application. So let's see what this looks like. Before we get to that, before I run it, just want to quickly show you, over here is Express Test 2. It's already running in my EKS cluster, and here we have Express Test 1. Express Test 2 is running on this node over here. You'll see 2165, and Express Test 1 is running on 0087. Just want to quickly come here so you can see that. You see we have 0087 over there. I'm going to describe that. And I'm going to scroll down. And I just want to highlight this particular thing to you. So you can see there, this particular node is running in EU West 1A. So that's where one of our applications lives. And then this is our other Carpenter controlled node. If I scroll down, you'll see that this one is running in EU West 1C. All right, so next thing I'm gonna do is simply run this load balancing script. There we go, so we've got responses of version 1.1.2 and some from version 1.1.4. Now, if we're honest, it's really hard to deduce that the destination rules are actually working. For all we know, it's just a random approach. So the best way to verify this is to actually go back to our code editor and modify the destination rules. And instead, what we're going to say is we want, regardless of where the traffic is coming from, we want 98% of it to be sent to EU West 1A. So I'm going to apply this for, to each of them. Oh, that's wrong. Apply that. Okay, so that's configured. Run the load balancing script again. And you'll see now, this time we're just getting version 1.1.2. So that's just one way to verify to ensure that our destination rules are actually working as expected. Great. All right, so I'll move over to a bit of time of uh, Q&A now. Yeah, well. That was brilliant. Thank you, Lakona. Do we have sure. any questions? Yes, we do. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for. Can you hear me? Yes, yes loud and clear. Thank you for your talk. Um, I just wanted to go back to the Carpenter config, uh, specifically under the topology spread constraints. And um, I noticed you set a condition to schedule anyway for and unsatisfiable, and I feel like that kind of introduces variation, right? And some things might just s slip under, under the bus. Was that intentional? Yes, yeah, no, that was intentional. Um, so it, again, it's gonna depend on the, how critical your workload is. If you're fine with having those pods, those pods ending up in a pending state, um, then, that would, then you can essentially change that value to a different approach. Um, so it's, to, it's totally up to you, depending on the type of application you're running and how critical it is to continue running. Obviously, the, uh, the desired approach is to have high availability across your different topology domains, but then this is an attempt by the scheduler to take those rules into consideration when it's applying them. So it just comes down to how do you want it to respond in the case that those constraints can't be satisfied. Yeah. We have more questions, I suppose? Yes. 
left one first. Look, thank you very much, first sure. of all. Uh, I would like to ask you something related to Carpenter because I, I've been using it in production for, for a client of mine. Yeah. And one of the issues I find out uh, mm -hmm. is that uh, while Carpenter works really well with scaling and regarding like uh, memory or CPU or this yeah. kind of statistic, mm -hmm. uh, disk space uh, is actually a problem. Like I had the node crashing, like application crashing just simply because the node uh, was, the disk space was not enough uh, and stuff like right. that. Uh, is that something that it's possible to monitor with Carpenter and uh, like uh, handle this kind of problem too, or no? Yeah. So in that case, I would I think it's probably best to have to make use of an aver observability stack in that situation um, because you want to use take advantage of tools like Prometheus and have that be monitoring what's actually taking place on your particular nodes and rather be sending alert messages so that you're aware of it. Um, in terms of optimizing those particular nodes, um, probably just making sure, if it's a case of disk space, making sure you have the, re the, amount, the right amount of storage in place for that, and also just reviewing the instance families as well. Um, yeah, those, are, those would probably be the two main starting points. Just reviewing the disk storage space that you're actually using, trying to see what exactly is consuming that quickly, and, al and, also, and better yet, making use of the observability stack to actually monitor your nodes. Thanks yeah. for the talk. Yeah. Um, I have a question regarding um, when you're talking about um, the topology spread, like mm -hmm. in the beginning, and the fact that we have quite a lot of information o on where our workloads are actually deployed in which zone in the given cloud provider. Mm -hmm. We have this information on the pods because pods are in the nodes. Yeah. And we also have this uh, resource called the endpoint. So we, are, yeah. we know how t um, where to route um, our traffic so that it ends up in the particular uh, availability zone. However, I also noticed that in one of the configuration files, when you were showing uh, how to set up Istio, yeah. uh, there w you had the configuration on, basically you had the paths configured in such a way that um, there were names of these zones in the paths. Yeah. So m my guess is that um, there is no information right now on how to, at least in Kubernetes, like vanilla Kubernetes, mm -hmm. on where the traffic comes from. Like this has to be done on the external load balancer, like either on-premises or provided by the cloud provider, right? Right, I see what you mean, yes, that's correct, yeah. Okay. So in this case, because my load, I knew that my load balancer, it's an external load balancer created by the Istio Ingress Gateway, it's an EU West 1, um, and so that's why I was able to implement those specific rules. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Lukonde. Yeah. Um, that was uh, last question. We have, uh, we are a little bit off schedule at the moment, but we're gonna we're gonna come back with it. I'm going to be very selfish, and I'm gonna ask Lukonde to have a photo with me. All <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Cool. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please give it up for him. Okay, we are we are back in schedule now. <laughs> uh, we're gonna s we're gonna have the next talk in uh, ten minutes at two thirty. So please don't leave my room or call your friends to come upstairs and have a fuller room. Thank you very much. I have I have sorry. sorry.